I have asked this morning, and he has acquiesced, and he is here. Rishi Maharaj, who is the CEO of Disclosure Today. Rishi, it's good to see you again this morning. Well, thanks for having me, and good morning to your listeners. It is good to have you here this morning. Um, I laid out just a, a small background as to what FATCA is about, and why is it important for all of Trinidad and Tobago, all of Trinidad and Tobago, every side of it, because if you transact business of any kind, you consume anything, you spend money anywhere in or out of Trinidad and Tobago, you will be affected by this. Because if, in fact, there is a withholding of 30%, any transaction that takes place, wherever it is allowed to take place, is going to impact on you and the cost of what we do. Because it means that, broken down, if you spend $1, only 70 cents is really going to mean anything. All right, what is your understanding of what is going on with this fat cut and the objections that we are seeing? Some opine reciprocity is a concern. Some opine people want to say it wasn't me. But, but give me, give me, <laughs> give me your take on this. Uh, enough shaggy here well, for the well, moment. Basically, you, you, you've enunciated very well what, what factor is about. I mean, it came about in 2010. Uh, during the, the, the collapse of, of the U.S. economy, the housing crisis in, 20, in 2008, and the, the government wanted to find ways of what they realized is that there are a lot of U.S. citizens out there in foreign countries, but they don't pay the taxes that, that they own. Mm -hmm. So the government wanted to come out with a particular way to be able to capture this, eight, I think it was close to 10 million U.S. citizens who are based outside of the U.S. jurisdiction in order for them to be able to pay taxes to get more revenue into the economy. Mm -hmm. So that's where the whole idea of factor came about. Mm -hmm. What it is, it's more or less, uh, from my reading of it, is an extension of the IRS arm into other countries' jurisdiction. Yes. So what they've doing, they, ha they have two models that you can work with. Model one, which is the model that we signed on to, is that your, fo your foreign financial institutions, our banks, our insurance companies, our trading agencies, whatever, will send the information not directly to the IRS, to the Treasury, but it's going to send it to the Board of Inland Revenue or whatever your tax agency or tax authority is within your country. Mm -hmm. And then the country will then send it the information mm -hmm. when requested from to the, to the Treasury or to the IRS. Model two is where financial institutions sign direct agreements with the IRS and the Treasury and send the information directly to them. So what we've done is we've set about going about the model one mm -hmm. directory where we share the information through our board of inland revenue. And there, there's some sort, there, there's supposed to be a reciprocity within it where the US will also send us information. However, if you look at the intergovernmental agreement, the information we're sending to the US and the information they've agreed to send us is, is, is chalk and cheese. I mean, we're going to be sending a lot of information to the U.S. on information regarding not only U.S. citizens, but people who are green card holders, mm -hmm. people who may have been born in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and then they, they came back to Trinidad, live in Trinidad, or people who have resided in the U.S. for a particular period of time. So there's a long capture list of people who are going to be captured by this, not only you know, it's U.S. citizens, people say, well, yeah, U.S. citizens, no, you have a green card, but there's a long mm -hmm. list of people who are going to be captured by this. So what the U.S. is doing, what they've done, is that they've more or less strong whole countries mm -hmm. throughout the world. I mean, down to Russia and China have signed on to factor. Canada said we don't like this the way it is being done, but then Canada can afford to do that. They are the biggest trading partner with the United yeah, States. They, they can discuss. The, the, the others, and, and the yes. others can because most of your trade and currency goes through the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, the U.S. currency, for want of another mm -hmm. word, is the de facto world currency. So, I mean, there's very little negotiating room that most countries, worse, less Caribbean countries have. Let's do this, this slowly, uh, Rishi Maharaj is my guest you're hearing. Let's go. We're getting back to reciprocity, which I think is the um, elephant in the room in just one second. Let's just deal with, ex uh, ask you to, to reiterate, repeat exactly what you said so folks understand it, because that too is my understanding. This is about the U.S. tax system saying we've got... Um, our people, nationals of the United States, along green card holders, who are um, obligated to pay taxes. They have not been doing that. Maybe ill reporting, you know, uh, erroneously recording, uh, reporting numbers and so on. So primarily this is put in place so they can request of the agreeing governments, Trinidad and Tobago specifically in this case, um, to give the information should they request it of one of their nationals. That is primarily the purpose of this. That's correct. Now, did you say implicit in there <laughs> is the question of reciprocity? It is. I mean, when you read the inter inter intergovernmental <laughs> agreement, which is part of the legislation, there is, there, there is part of it, I think it is Article 3.3 of it that deals with the agreement of the U.S. government to provide information 
to the Trinidad and Tobago in this case, so to any other country who they sign agreements with, information on those nationals who reside within the U.S. jurisdiction to the government so that they can also do their follow-up. Who reside in the U.S. Ju jurisdiction or who either reside or own property? Reside or the, own property. Yes. So, so money and financial transactions go through the U.S. financial banking system, insurance system. I think uh, it's important you know, that we stocks, put that Stocks in, and trade yes. system. And it's a standard agreement. When you look at hmm. the model agreement, it's there mm -hmm. for most of all of the countries. However, well, when I was <laughs> doing some research on this, there is an issue that has been propping up. I don't think most people have read about this or have been told about it, but the issue now is enforceability of that reciprocity of the U.S. Enforceability from Trinidad standpoint? No, from the U.S. From standpoint. The US. Explain. Exa in that the IRS, but we've more or less signed agreement with the, with the U.S. Treasury and the IRS. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is, does the IRS and the, and the, and the Treasury have the ability to, to force the U.S. government to be able to give this. If you look at the if you look at the model agreement, it more or less states that there's an agreement from the United States that we will work to have proper legislation in place. So the one way be able street to have this is what has to be done now, right. but the, re the reciprocal part right. is the one that you're saying legislation is needed. Legislation, if you look at the intergovernmental agreement, there is, there is implied in it that legislation has mm -hmm. to be put on the books mm -hmm. within the U.S., which means you have to go to the Congress and the Senate to be able to get this passed, to put proper legislation mm -hmm. in place to ensure that the U.S. sends the exact the same kind of information that they requested from us, that they send it to us also. You are so there, a needs to, there needs to be that 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 similarity you are a watchdog group which means you have the same concerns i would assume that the honorable opposition leader has articulated uh to see that citizens information is kept um secret in the right channels is uh, handled um you know uh, with the due care mm -hmm. um but if we are all on the same side of ensuring that this is something that happens between the BIR or the Revenue Authority, whichever it is, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the Treasury Department or the IRS, as the case be. What is the objection I am hearing? Because I, I, I am not understanding, first of all, as you articulated accurately, Model 1 was chosen. This has been there for quite some time. Our finance minister has repeatedly um, said that what is being um, what has been put before the opposition is no different because we do not have the power to go and change the terms and conditions so there is essentially nothing that can be changed this is a boiler a template agreement right. coming out of the United States help me understand from your vantage point what are you seeing that would be objectionable in this case well, I think one of the main objections that the opposition seem to be raising and it's an objection that actually when you look at the research has happened a lot in countries in the European Union, in New Zealand, in Canada, in Australia, uh, because those countries have within them proper privacy legislation mm -hmm. in place mm -hmm. that deals with the way that the public sector and the private sector handles one's personal information and one's sensitive personal information. When you read the legislation that's been proposed that, based on the Minister of Finance, originated from the previous administration. Mm -hmm. And the only thing they changed it was from 2015 to 2016. It's, it's, it's the same information. It's yes. It's the legislation. It more or less deals with the Board of Inland Revenue processing sensitive personal information and sending it to a U.S. government. And the whole question of privacy and privacy concerns come into play because the act now is in contravention of Section 4 and 5 of the Constitution. That's why it needs a special majority. What other countries have done that because they have proper privacy legislation in place and proper information commissioners or privacy commissioners that have been enacted that have been set up they've had consultation with these bodies to ensure that whatever systems and frameworks they put in place to share this information with the u.s that it still has a measure of protection we haven't done that in Trinidad and tobago mm. although we've passed our data protection legislation in 2011 and the act mentions the data protection act in it we have not taken the step forward in my opinion, to set up the Office of the Information Commissioner, which, if was set up, would be able to provide proper insight into how this information that's been collected by the banks, shared with BIR, and then from BIR moved to the Treasury and the IRS, that proper systems are in place or frameworks are in place, checks and balances are in place to ensure that sensible information is only shared between these parties and there is no risk of 
it leaking or getting down to the public domain or nobody who is supposed to have the information is going to get access to the information. Let us be very clear. The voice you're hearing is that is Rishi Maharaj of Disclosure Today. He's not the voice of the opposition. Because of the question I'm about to ask you mm -hmm. is the reason why I, yeah. I lay that disclaimer here. Let us see if I get this right. So the prior administration um, chose option one. Right. They looked at it. It was initialized, uh, but all, that's all it's been initialized. Right? Mm -hmm. It's been there for a long time. Right. These concerns you were talking about that are being raised are concerns they saw. Yes. Would it not have been prudent then realizing that there is no way you can fight City Hall, mm -hmm. quote unquote? There's nothing you can do about it. You got to sign it at some point. Exactly. That these things should have been corrected then, as against waiting till we get down to our 12 now to insist on, and, and I'm just giving in. Okay, that's a good concern. I'm just giving in. All right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 th 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 that is where I'm lost because well, now, n n because from the standpoint of the entire country now, mm -hmm is going up against the wall. I am not too sure I want to say the sky is falling because I'm confident. I feel optimistic that an extension will be granted. It's I am optimistic it's, it's, it's about that. So I'm not going to say the sky is going to fall. Right. What I don't understand is the sudden um, upheaval, the sudden concern, and, 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 and where did this come from? It sounds, from the way it is articulated in the public arena, is that this was something that the government of the day put into the agreement and and and, and i think my understanding and even from what you have articulated this morning that mm -hmm. is not so no it's not so i mean if you look at the timeline that was given by the minister of finance and it's out in the public domain this has been going on since 2013 2014 mm -hmm. and the ag mm -hmm. at the time recommended in 2014 that the minister of finance signed the intergovernmental agreement and in september 2014 the minister of finance wrote agreeing to enter into the intergovernmental agreement uh, in December 2014, mm. the U.S. indicated that negotiations between both parties have come to an end and they're happy now to move forward to mm -hmm. sign in the agreement. That agreement was not signed until August of this year. So between December 2014 and August of 2016, the agreement was not signed. So obviously there has to be some level of blame shifted to the opposition that was then in government. Why was there a delay in signing the agreement and moving forward with the proper legislation? But also I think a, a blame also has to be placed on the government because the government would have inherited this in September when they assumed the office on, on, in September 2015. Mm -hmm. From my understanding, the, the deadline then was September 30th, 2015, to have everything in place. Mm. But of course, new government assumed office, so there were certain things that had to get done. They applied to the U.S. Treasury to get an extension, and the extension was given until September 30th of this year for the government to sign the intergovernmental agreement, have the proper legislation in place to give enforcement to this intergovernmental agreement so then you can move forward and share any information. I am comfortable. Why, why I'm was there also a delay between September 2015 and now for the intergovernmental agreement to be signed and then move forward with, trans with the legislation. I think while I understand the concerns of the government that the opposition is, is, is playing politics with it, and it is, for, for want of a better word, a playing of politics with it, I think the, the government also has to share, share some blame. And why was there a delay in moving mm. forward and signing the intergovernmental agreement, which they agreed and stated in the public domain that it's, it's the same agreement that the, the previous government had agreed to. I am going to give... Uh, credence um, to the uh, the whole privacy issue. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to even uh, say, okay, that's fine. What I don't understand is the misrepresentation of the facts regarding this mm -hmm. now. Yes. Because it puts a cloud over, I mean, even understanding the act. You look at the act I I initially and you realize uh, mm -hmm. when you hear statements that uh, come out that say I'm protecting the privacy of Trinidad and Tobago nationals when FATCA essentially is about American <laughs> nationals. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And then and then break it down the way you did this morning and you say, okay, the, the, the reciprocal part of that is something that we have to be concerned about because we need to get the legislation in place to deal with mm -hmm. that. Then that is something else. I... I, I, I um, hmm. I am just wondering uh, how close to the edge are we going to keep this sense of uh, everything is chaotic in this country before folks just sit down and say, listen, this is the agreement we have. This is what we're looking at. You're going to put up your BIR or your Revenue Insurance Authority, um, and we need to get these people in place. Let's put this in place. And uh, Because part of the argument that you hear is that the uh, Minister of Finance is the one going to be um, privy to this information. Right. And, and while that is true, that is something that was done 
Not by the present <laughs> government. Exactly. <laughs> Although, the designee. I mean, when, you, when you look at the debate that happened, was it this Friday? Or this, mm. this, this Friday. Mm-hmm. In the House. When the, the, op- the, 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 when the Minister of Finance raised some of the concerns that were flagged by the opposition in, in a press ad, by the oh way, yes. the, the, uh, <laughs> I think it was yeah. the press ad was, on the, was issued on the Thursday, um, highlighting some of their, their concerns regarding it. Um, the, I think the Minister of Finance at that, at that debate, mm-hmm. at the session on Friday, indicated that they were willing to make amendments to the legislation mm-hmm. based on some of the arguments put forward by the opposition. So there seemed to be some willingness to, to be flexible, even with, especially regards to, I think it's Section 6 and Section 7, mm-hmm. that says that the Minister or his delegate and that question of whether you have access to information. So they were willing to make amendments. And I'm happy for that because that is something and that is part that we have an input right. into. And that's, yes. it, and, that's the, and that's why we elected a government, but that's why we also elected mm-hmm. an opposition. So they can mm-hmm. work together to get proper things passed within a respectable time frame. But you, under, you, you, you understand where my problem yeah, is exactly. here? Because on the one hand, I, I, I applaud the minister for wanting to do some adjustment here. I'm saying you are the one who said the minister of finance would be in charge of this before. <laughs> it was you were the one got the model the first time. Yeah, this was I mean, yours. Um, cause it, cause the quantity so what was finance. it? Convenient then and not convenient now? Yeah, is, the is CPC more or less drafted mm-hmm. legislation in the first quarter of 2015. Mm. So, but then th- th- that's how I mean. I, I've seen it before. Mm-hmm. Where, where I mean, it actually happened to me when I was in when I, when I worked in a previous ministry dealing actually with the data protection legislation. That le- legislation was initially drafted under a PNM administration mm-hmm. between two thousand and eight and two thousand and ten. Uh, when we sent it to Parliament, Parliament said, "Let's go to a joint select committee." Subsequently, lapsed. When the the elections were held and the, the former opposition then became the government. Obviously, then we tailored back the bill, and the bill was again submitted to the cabinet. And we, would, we would outlined to the then government, well, these are some of the questions you raise when you're in opposition. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, you know, that's what we're in opposition. We're just playing politics. <laughs> talk about. That's what happens, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. That's it's, what, it's, but it's part of the but something okay. as important as this yes. and the impact mm. it can have on the economy, because you mentioned 30% withholding tax, that if it is, isn't put in place in a, the proper time frame, mm-hmm. it's going to have an impact on our business, everything, on our, on our banking sector, mm-hmm. on even if you you have an aunt who's in the US who's going to send information, mm-hmm. who's going to send money from you to the bank, everything is going to be impacted. So it's going to have a real serious impact. You're going to take care of your kids on, who are going to school. On, yeah, mm-hmm. on, all, on all our businesses. So I mean, something like this ha- that has going to have a major shockwave. We are looking at uh, 24 minutes away from the top of the hour. The CEO of Disclosure Today is Rishi Maharaj. He mentioned about the Data Protection Act. Give our listeners quick, a quick backdrop as to where were you when you were involved in this and, uh, and what is the Data Protection Act all about? Because we mentioned it just that folks understand because it's germane to this discussion. It here. is, because I mean, it's mentioned in legislation. That's the dealing with this whole idea factor. The data protection legislation first came on about, uh, I would say, in 2007-2008, where uh, we were looking at having proper legislation in place to govern the way that the public sector and the private sector handles people's personal information. It came about because several countries throughout the world are now moving towards having proper data protection legislation, or privacy protection legislation, especially because of the e-commerce that's taking place. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are not putting their information out there in, in, into the public domain. So the way that your private sector and public sector handles your, your data protection legislation. A policy was developed, and from the policy, a, a bill came about. I mean, I think the first iteration of the bill came out in, in 2010. And we sent it to Parliament under the then Minister of Information. I was part of a technical team that worked with the Minister of Information, Ministry of Public Administration, and the CPC, which is the Chief Parliamentary Council, dealing with the draft of legislation and putting together this bill. Um, we went to Parliament. Parliament said that, you know, let's go to a joint select committee. Went to a joint select committee. Elections came about. Uh, there was a the bill lapsed, obviously. Mm-hmm. New administration came in, so again, we brought it forward that we need to have the data protection legislation in, put in place, mm-hmm. primarily because the government at the time was moving towards implementing com- something called a single economic window mm-hmm. through the Ministry of Trade and Industry, which was to be this one window which people can use to transact business, to register the company, to deal with customs, to deal with all sorts of things, licenses. And you need to have proper legislation in place to govern these things. So we worked with the government uh, at the time, went to Parliament, passed the bill. The bill was passed in 2011. So it's now an act of Parliament, and it was partially proclaimed. And that certain principles of the bill were proclaimed, act was proclaimed, Mm -hmm. as well as the part dealing with the setting up of the Office of Information Commissioner. In the legislation, we propose 
the setting up of the Office of Information Commissioner using the model that exists in the UK. And that Information Commissioner is going to be appointed by the President, and his office is going to have control over setting up proper systems and frameworks in place that governs the way all government and all private sector organizations collect, store, share, disseminate uh, information within themselves, mm -hmm. within government to private, private to government, and within government to government, or private to private externally, to have proper systems in place. Uh, today, that legislation, although it has been passed and has been partially proclaimed, uh, the Information Commission Office has not been set up as yet. And this Information Commissioner, I guess, can easily work into this whole uh, FATCA issue. It does, because, I mean, you're, dealing with, about, you're yes. dealing with privacy. I mean, when yes. you look at the Data Protection Bill Act, it mm. specifies that people's financial information is, in fact, personal information and sensitive mm. personal information. So you're dealing with that. That's why when you look at this, this act that deals with FACTA, it mentions that although you are going against data protection principles and the act, you know, these things has to happen. But what other countries have done is that in setting up their proper legislation to give force mm -hmm. to the intergovernmental agreement that they've signed. I mean, examples of, I'll give you the example of New Zealand, for example. They actually held discussions with their privacy commissioner. So he had an input in drafting legislation to ensure that whatever system was put in place that at least they obviously they didn't disagree with the whole idea of government sharing information with government. A very tight tunnel being used. You have, used. You mm -hmm. have proper Channels. systems mm -hmm. in place so that people's information mm -hmm. don't get into the wrong hand. Understood. So there's a control mechanism in place. Understood. Now we understand what that is about. Uh, just that our listeners be equally clear. Your organization has been doing a lot of work in this area. That's the reason I called you here and have called you before. Give them a, a, a quick look into Disclosure Today. Well, Disclosure Today is a not-for-profit, uh, non-political organization. Uh, we deal with the whole idea of, of transparency and good governance and being a watchdog, an uh, eye on the way government is, is working for us. We have a platform, you can see it, you can visit it on www.disclosure.today in which you can sign up to our platform and through that platform, you're able to make freedom of information requests to public authorities or you can work with us and we can guide you in how you make your freedom of information requests. We have lawyers who assist us on the platform to give you free legal advice and making your freedom of information requests. We also, if you want to make a request, but there's a fear that you don't want to make it in your name, then we have mechanisms to be able to allow you to make it confidentiality and, and anonymous so that your name isn't seen, but, but disclosure they will make on your behalf. As it relates to a government, there's information that the public is entitled to. Most folks may not know they're entitled to it, but it can be had if there is resistance or not or unavailability. There is the avenue of the Freedom of Information yes, it is. Uh, Act is what we are talking about. Yeah. And your organization will assist folks to pull out information, mm -hmm. uh, many uh, of it which is hid. In, 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 into the glare of the exactly. Okay. Okay. And then they can get up to your website simply by hitting the disclosure um, today and you will get the information. You mentioned a moment ago that the, um, <clears throat> the commissioner will be appointed by the president. Yes. Good. Let's go to the president. <laughs> the Auditor General. Yes. The Auditor General says I'm looking at 2.6 in some areas. I see 2.8 anyway, above $2.5 million in expenditure that is not um, explained fully. Um, some folks think that they are picking on the president unfairly. Some folks say, as the Auditor General said, that he saw and made the request back in March, allowing three weeks for it to be corrected. April came, April is gone. We are all the way in September that there is what is called the public right to know not only that, mm -hmm. the statutory requisite that it be done. Speak to uh, speak to your take on this. Well, situation. I mean, the Auditor General is is, a, is also a creature of the Constitution, mm. created by the Constitution, and the Auditor General has a specific responsibility. The responsibility of the Auditor General is to have a check and balance on the the expenditure and the spending of all public sector agencies, ministries, um, state agencies, state enterprises, uh, and and the president. Because I mean, the president monies are allocated through Parliament mm -hmm. in the budget every year. So the Auditor General is, is in his report. I think would have raised mm. concerns with regards to monies that were spent having proper approvals mm -hmm. in place for these things or having, uh, I believe, people's pension leave records weren't given on time and stuff like that. So there are a number of concerns that the other general raised. And I think if the president being the highest office in the land and uh, has, to, has, to, has to have that, exhume that, that whole idea and live the philosophy of being open, transparent, and accountable, which is a statement that the president has made on numerous occasions since he assumed the role of president, I think in the end there needs to be 
definitely some some level of, of explanation from the office of the president as to exactly how do you explain these these things that have been highlighted by the auditor general. And the president has said that he will uh, make uh, a disclosure tomorrow. Uh, at least uh, uh, some information coming out of his office is that he will address these yeah. issues uh, tomorrow. I um. I, I just got a little lost between waiting for that report to come and then hearing the Republic message, <laughs> and I go like, okay, which one am I listening to? Did, 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 were you confused yeah, at some point? I, I mean, going through it, you, you're like uh, mm -hmm. understanding the initial st setting the stage and the idea of what mm -hmm. republicanism is and the importance mm -hmm. of republicanism, mm -hmm. I guess more so than, than independence, but then getting into the whole idea and tirade of, of journalism and journalistic principles. I mean, I, I honestly don't think that that's the that's the role yeah. or the the, uh, the the forum exactly for mm -hmm. this to be mm -hmm. addressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. certain things were raised in the public domain. I mean, I think we've moved away now from not only news houses and uh, uh, making inquiries from a journalistic point of view, but we've now moved now into the era of of social media and citizen journalism, where citizens are now using the social media as a way and a platform. To be able to, to highlight certain things that probably traditional media may not have picked up on, mm -hmm. and then they can now use it as a way and a form to, to inquire and to see exactly what's going on. So I don't think it, it was it was the, the proper place or forum for him to, to air these things out in the public, especially given that it was supposed to be a public day address to the nation, exactly from uh, the highest you know, office in the land. And, the, and and you know you 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 read it in the beginning um, for the most part. Well, I think it was the first two paragraphs. It was uplifting exactly to young was. people yeah. to their you know what you. Can do for your country give do not you know fall prey to those the naysayers and so on and that was all nice and then they slipped in in the middle there and i went like okay did somebody pick up the anchor somewhere but i'm looking forward to hear uh, what they what yeah, they, I i'm sure i'm sure nation, you are nation the whole is looking forward to hear his explanation because it is not it. only the question of 2.8 million dollars because your business is is monitoring everything mm -hmm. um in the in, in in the public domain there is the issue of um overreaching as Martin Daly called it, exactly. as it relates to calling. What, what, what is the view, if any, of your organization on the president calling in the Minister of National Security by passing the Prime Minister, uh, which one would expect he would have done, um, to inquire of the, the, the crime and the plans for the country? What, what is well, your organization I mean, there, to, if there is a position? There is a, I mean, if you, if you look at the, the remit of the office of the president, he is, at the end of the day, the commander in chief mm -hmm. of the armed forces, of mm -hmm. which the, the police service would be consider part of the, of the armed forces and the Minister of National Security being the person in charge of that. So, I mean, there is some leeway. You can state that, okay, given that he is the Commander-in-Chief of the armed forces, he may have some some avenue to be able to see exactly what's going on, not to question. But does this but, not fall into but, policy? But there, there, there needs to be, I mean, again, some sort of protocol. I mean, yes. I'm sure, and, that, and that's the thing. Although he may be Commander-in-Chief of the armed forces, mm. protocol always needs to be followed. And yeah, and if if you want to, nothing if you if the president if the president wants to call a, a, a minister, I mean, and, and send a message, minister, I, I want to talk to you. Obviously, no minister is going to say no. I'm not going to talk to you. But there needs to be some protocol followed, in that you need to go through. I would think, the office of the prime minister, to get if not to get the prime minister's consent, to let the, at least allow the prime minister to be aware of the fact that this is going to be happening, based on what we've seen or what we've heard in the public domain. The prime minister. Seem to be at least unaware based on what we've heard. In addition to that, there's supposed to be um, regular consultation between, between the, the president and the prime minister. Yeah, they're supposed mm -hmm. to meet on a regular basis. Okay, there's uh, going to be a whole question of ceremonial and executive and who's reaching where. Yeah. Your business is watchdog, watchdog, as I said. Uh, the disclosure today is the organization. I do want to ask you one year after the new government. Folks have been talking about their performance. I'm not talking performance. I'm talking about the transparency and the accountability and an avenue for an organization like you to say, yes, in fact, the, uh, the trajectory is in the direction of disclosure and transparency. Speak to me what you have seen in the last year coming out of the new administration. Well, I think during the last year, the administration has sent, um, at least slowly, some signals in the right direction, one being the the amendment to and the passage of the legislation dealing with the proper procurement legislation to set up the office or the, or the procurement regulator. So I think that has been, has been a step in the right direction. You've also seemed to see a lot of ministers being more open with regards to discussing exactly what's going on and what their policy place is. However, I think that being said, from a transparency and an openness point of view, especially being able to be open to give allowing the public to know exactly what they're doing, I think we, we're still in, in, the same, in the same boat. 
I think we still seem to see that that top down approach to governance. This is not place. policy. This is legislatively. You're speaking of not legislatively, no. but but holistically. I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, we have sent uh, recently to to part of one thing of disclosure that is doing is that we're now setting up. We've actually set up the platform, and we're about to launch something called the Manifesto Watch mm -hmm. platform which is on, on our, our sister website to Disclosure today, www.polywatch. Uh, this is a new, oh, yeah. oh, you should have had that for a long time. <laughs> that should have been there in the last five years too. <laughs> but, but I'm happy the, right, the, yeah. the move is made to do Poly it. Polywatch, yeah. See, mm -hmm. if you go to our, our page, www.polywatch.info, there's, there's a link on that that deals with something called the Manifesto Watch, in which we've taken a page out of something an NGO, I think, would have done in Canada, in which they set up something to monitor the Canadian government and the promises that they have made. Mm -hmm. So we've set up the mm -hmm. Manifesto Watch page in that we now have listed on it all the Manifesto promises broken on by sector for the administration. Manifesto as it is policies. Exactly, what you're because yeah, because the manifesto is now the official government policy, yes, policy. Okay. which mm -hmm. is what most mm -hmm. governments do when mm -hmm. they assume office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing right now is that most governments have, mm -hmm. ministries, all ministries have been asked, mandated by cabinet to develop action plans based on the policy based on the policies of the manifesto that align to their particular ministry what we're trying to do now is to get copies of those action plans from ministries to be able to be to, to, to form a better gauge to be able to monitor exactly are these manifesto promises being kept or not being kept uh we've gotten some from some ministries but for some other agencies we're, hit, we're hitting a brick wall with regards to getting this information so there seems to still be that lack of being open with regards to letting the public know exactly what you're doing mm -hmm. on our behalf. Because at the end of the day, public min ministries, state enterprises function on behalf of the public. So uh, we, we still see, although the government has been singing the right song, has been saying the right things, I think from an implementation point of view for this past year, they still we still have some luggage with regards to government being more open and transparent in terms of the way it operates. Disclosure today, looking at um, governance, uh, and, and, and how these the accountability question happens here in Trinidad. I know that an organization that you are affiliated to looks into the whole question of uh, the rights of citizens and so on as, as far as um, seeing that uh, law and due process is given to the citizenry. It moves me, of course, you know where I'm going because you're smiling. It moves me to our Chief Justice. And our Chief Justice said the system is broken and the only way, um, one of the ways we can fix this is to have jury less trials mm -hmm. uh, disclosure today will be monitoring that uh, tell me what is your take on that all right let, let me answer from from this point of view i'll probably put on my hat i had when i was former uh, director research policy plan in the ministry of justice mm -hmm. in which we dealt with the whole idea of prisons and judiciary our judiciary system on the whole uh is severely hampered hampered by several things it's hampered by the fact that we have a, a lot of people within the, in, within remand waiting to, to await trial sometimes the, according to the stats you wait close to seven to eight years before your, your trial has even started so we have that that backlog taking place as hampering the, the system we also have very limited amount of judges to be able to handle these trials as well as proper infrastructure in place so we have, no we have a lot of problems within our system I would tend to agree. I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I wouldn't speak on behalf of the lawyers out there, but I, I would tend to agree with the Chief Justice that we need to relook our model of our judicial system, and especially our criminal justice system, mm -hmm. in terms of the way that we deal and treat with people who are accused of misgivings, who are brought before the system and being able to do it in a timely manner. He has mentioned the whole idea of jurorless trials. It's nothing new throughout the world. A lot of countries have gone, gone about the way of jurorless trials for certain levels of of um, crimes, uh, I believe in the case of Japan, you sit before a body of three or four judges. I, I believe it is. I think also in the case, I mean, a good example have been the case recently last year of Oscar Pistorius in South Africa, where his trial took place. I think it's actually a judge <laughs> that is sat before and not, not the jury. Mm -hmm. So there are countries mm -hmm. in the world, even Commonwealth countries in the world, who have gone about. And even way. then, it can go awry, as in the case yeah, of exactly. that gentleman that they had to review it, and then exactly. Mm -hmm. So I mean. Mm -hmm. In the end of the day, I would agree with the Chief Justice that our criminal justice system has to be adjusted, has to be amended, to, f to be fixed properly. However, I think any way moving forward to fix the system needs to have proper stakeholder consultation. I mean, also a disclosure today will always agree that you need to involve your stakeholders in whatever system you want to put in place. Mm -hmm. this, may involve, this is going to involve the Law Association, uh, the Criminal Bar Association, uh, dealing with uh, different other stakeholders out there. They have a lot of NGOs that deal with prisoners in, in the prison 
the prison of the prisons prison officer association that litany of stakeholders that needs to be engaged it's something that you can't just implement overnight it's not going to take one year it's not going to take two years you're talking about systemic change and therein lies one of now. the problems that that, that that we face because um everyone has um bought into maybe the world has shoved it down our throat sufficiently totally inculcated in us that we must have instant coffee instant everything and as we see happening here um and i'm not saying it's wrong i'm just saying with the the, 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 the ascent of a new government, everybody want everything now and yeah, want exactly. all the changes yeah. now because what folks are asking is for you to turn the ship of state around like it's a boat. And even to turn a, a, a big <laughs> boat like an aircraft carrier, you have to start planning for that turn exactly. a while mm. away, a far away. So it takes a while to turn around a ship, to turn around an economy, mm. to change any system. I mean, we're talking about the, the problem we have in Trinidad Tobago is that we have a lot of systems. I mean, just reading today i think the leader of the msj talked about a, a, a second republic they all broke down in yes. that, in that mm-hmm. our systems were inherited from a colonial system mm-hmm. we've inherited we've somehow mm-hmm. entrenched that system as part of our normal day-to-day lives and now to be able to move away from that into a new system it's going to take time it's going to take time but i think we all need to and it needs to be a collaborative effort everybody's got the hunger for change not everybody have the patience for yeah, change exactly uh, is six minutes away from the top of the hour. In conclusion, I am confident in my mind that the leader of the opposition and the opposition want exactly what you, I, and the government would like to see, which is the betterment of Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm optimistic that this FATCA situation will come to uh, 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 amicable settlement at some point. It has to come. I mean, it has to. I mean, the end of the day, the opposition and the government both would realize that it, this is going to affect everyone in the country. And I think in the end, politics, <laughs> is, is, it is what it is. And we need to understand that th- they're going to build politics in this matter. Unfortunately, in doing so, it, it, is, it is causing stress among the different sectors in the, in the country and in the economy. Mm-hmm. And eventually, good sense has to prevail. I, I, I am optimistic, and I believe we, are, we probably would get an extension from, from the U.S. government because of the strategic importance that train that plays from mm. a financial point of view and everything else with the U.S. Indeed. The US. Indeed. So we're going to get the extension. In addition to them wanting a new embassy and so on. Oh, that, well, yeah, did I, I say mean, that? Yeah, anyway. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I just find it curious. I just find it the timing of that quite curious. I, 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 I It was done on Twitter, by the way. It was done <laughs> yeah. by official community. Well, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> I looked at it nice. But, one. yeah, I think, I, I, again, like you, yeah, I think mm. about mm. Mr. that good sense will prevail. And the opposition will do proper due diligence. That's why we have an opposition. Mm-hmm, so the government mm-hmm, just can't mm-hmm, steamroll mm-hmm. legislation. The opposition is there for a purpose, to be yes. a check and balance. People will do their pocket um, politicking. Uh, uh, you know, you're gonna have you're gonna have constituencies being satisfied with what is said, uh, and sometimes outrageous, sometimes unconscionable, sometimes contradictory. But at the end of the day, looking at what is the price the nation has to pay, um, should this not be done, I don't think anybody local elections or not is going to take that chance with something that important. Oh, did I say local elections? Oh, yes, that's in October. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with this. No, I don't. <laughs> so. <I'm> <laughs> e- everything is linked one way or another. <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Rishi Maharaj, disclosure today. Folks, go up and uh, you put it inside. Of it. There's something very important that my guests mentioned here this morning that I want you to take with you um, with everything else. But if nothing else, at least take what he said. The freedom of information uh, for what is going on with those who govern us the, uh, the, there is an act there that allows us to get that information. If you don't know how to go about it, don't worry. If you don't want to put your name there when you're inquiring of it, don't worry. Go to their site, and you put in uh, what you would like to get. You give them the information they need that is protected, mm-hmm. and they will follow through and get that for you because an informed citizenry is the best army for the further runs of a, a country's well-being. It is. I mean, we are, we are the ones, that's, the government serves our purpose <laughs> and not the other way around. <laughs> what is it Barack said? <laughs> and the change I've been looking for, huh? <laughs> Rishi, thank you so much for taking no up your Sunday. And t- thank you again, as always, for being here with us. I truly appreciate it. Thanks for having me and good day to your listeners. And you have a wonderful day. I want to thank all my guests for being here. Uh, Peter Purnell, chairman of the Policy Holders Group, uh, Clico Policy Holders uh, Group, also want to thank the head of communications, corporate communications, Dion Legor, for joining me from uh, Caribbean Airlines, and of course, Rishi Maharaj. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with me, and come around and join me tomorrow morning 
from 6 until 9 o'clock. It is the morning show here on 107.7 with my co-host Michelle uh, Borrell. We will, of course, be back here next Sunday for another edition. Yep. Brunch in the morning. You have yourself a wonderful take here now. <laughs>